It was, I, I really enjoyed your presentations and seeing these plants. It reminds me, you know, you've got a pretty unique little uh, microclimate or climate here in San Diego compared to some of the, the rest of Northern California. So one thing is, you know, you've got different plants in many cases, some of them the same, but you're going to have different paths than uh, we have up in Davis or Sacramento or San Francisco. But uh, um, that's the variety of life. Uh, and so today, um, as uh, Kate said, I am going to be talking about integrated pest management uh, this morning, and then in the afternoon we're going to uh, have an introduction with, to pesticides with um, uh, some hands-on activity with uh, uh, pesticides to get you familiar with those. Uh, I think she introduced me pretty well. I, I was with the, uh, I'm, I'm trained as an entomologist. <laughs> Um, I was an uh, extension entomologist at the Department of Entomology at Davis for 35 years and also with the UC Statewide IPM program uh, up in Davis. Uh, and the IPM program, if you're not familiar with it, produces a lot of material uh, for uh, farmers uh, and also for gardeners and other types of people who uh, have pest problems. So we're, the IPM program is uh, the key sort of source of information for uh, master gardeners, hopefully for uh, pest management information. Um, I came on, when I came on, I, my, my, my job was really to create and develop information for farmers on integrated pest management. Uh, and this was when, in the, the early 1980s. Because one thing that was integrated pest management was a concept that was out there in the theoretical journals, but uh, really had trickled down to information on how growers could actually implement integrated pest management program. There was at that time uh, there was a lot of interest in reducing pesticides, but uh, there weren't, wasn't how-to information. So at the IPM program, we developed publications and resources for farmers on how to reduce pesticides uh, and use alternatives like biological control and cultural control. But one thing I noticed is I would <laughs> go places like the state fair or, and, and see the UC master gardeners out there and their resources they would have there for providing information to the public were, well, the ortho problem solver, which is a uh, a very nice book because it has lots of nice pictures in it, but for every pest you identify, the solution is always an ortho product, which is a pesticide. So, you know, that's not always the best solution. Or they would have the Rodale Organic Gardening book, which is also nice, but, you know, also does not, not everything that was recommended there really was either appropriate or um, uh, effective. So. I thought, the University of California needs to provide its master gardeners with some information that, with information relevant to California about how home gardeners and landscapers uh, can manage pests and landscapes. So that's sort of what I did in the big part of my career was creating these various publications uh, that hopefully you guys will learn to use and also the UC IPM website, which I'll be demonstrating a little bit of it uh, today, and which will be uh, a key resource for you when you have pest management questions. So I retired, uh, really, uh, I retired actually in, in 2014, but I'm still participating a little bit. In, uh, uh, I've been writing pest notes. I just came, the Amelibug pest note just came out. And it, there was somebody in the San, there's a San Diego master gardener, and I forgot what her name is, but she kept bugging me every, every six months I'd get this email about, how come you don't have a mealybug pest note? And I'd say, well, I'm working on it. And after about three or four years, and in my retirement, I'm proud to say that it's now posted. It takes some time uh, to do. Okay, and so in terms of integrated pest management, it's a wide field. It, uh, we're talking about uh, ecological or environmentally sound management of all kinds of pests. So that's insects and mites and snails and weeds and plant pathogens and vertebrates, 
Uh, all kinds of pests would be managed through this philosophy of integrated pest management. So in the, the short time that I have here with you, uh, I'm not going to be able to, uh, uh, you're, you're not going to become experts on integrated pest management. <laughs> Big disappointment. Uh, you can't because there's thousands of potential pests you may run into during your course of your career as master gardeners. Uh, what I want you to get out of this is I want you to have sort of a general framework for pests and integrated pest management and, and how you do it in an environmentally sound way. And most importantly, I want you to become familiar with the resources that you have to solve these problems when they come across your desk or come in your garden. That's when you're really going to learn how to manage a pest is when you've got that pest in your garden uh, or somebody comes in with a question, a sample, and you have to identify it and provide them some guidance on how to handle it. And, and that's the same thing. I know with, with all the, you guys as master gardeners get so much information uh, thrown at you in the course that it's, it's almost mind-boggling. But really, you're getting the principles and then as time goes on and you keep working with this material, you'll, you'll get more and more expertise. Uh, and so we just want to give you the basis so you can fly from here and, and use the UC uh, IPM materials when you have pest problems. And I also want to thank you for becoming Master Gardeners. I, you Master Gardeners are just wonderful and they are so important to us at, in the University of California. I know you, you spent a lot of time getting trained and then you spent a lot of time volunteering after you are trained and it's a it's a big time commitment but it really is worth it we as the University of California were a land-grant university and so uh, unlike San Diego State or or Stanford which primarily focuses on training students and maybe doing research um, the University of California as a land-grant university also has the responsibility for providing information to farmers and the general public, science-based information to help them do their jobs and lead their lives better. And so we have, what, 36, 38 million people in California. Uh, every single one of them has a pest problem at some time. Uh, and we need to get information out to them. And we have hardly any paid employees who are charged with that. And so you are the primary way that we transfer information to the California public about horticulture and uh, pest management. And so you are just part of the chain. Uh, and you are linked to the, the, the researchers at the University of California on the campuses, particularly Riverside, Davis, and Berkeley. Um, and the Cooperative Extension offices where there's scientists also uh, who are developing the information, but you are one of the key delivery uh, units. So you are linked and you are part of us. And when you wear your Master Gardener badge, remember that you're part of the University of California. And that's why we want you to be using uh, University of California information, uh, not information from Texas or information from the ortho problem solver uh, in general. We hope we've provided enough information for you and, and if there's information that hasn't been become, remember your colleague, the master gardener who kept bugging you about the mealy bug pest note. Um, now I'm gone from the UCIPM program, but Carrie uh, Winville Rojas is the uh, urban person there and you can tell her to get one of those publications. <laughs> or tell Scott and he'll tell her. Okay, so with that, we'll start. So uh, the big question is, what is integrated pest management? So the first thing about it is it is an ecosystem-based strategy. So we are working in our gardens in ecosystems. Back in the, the bad old days, people would see a bug on their plant, and they would just stop there and say, bad bug and they would go out and they would spray it or whatever. Now with an ecosystem kind of strategy you're looking at your whole system. You're looking at the plant and the bug. What is the bug doing there? Is it maybe not doing anything bad? Maybe it's a good bug. 
can it really injure that plant? What in the environment is, is causing that plant to grow poorly or, or uh, causing that bug to be m multiplying a lot? So you're really looking at it in the context of the ecosystem. <coughs> there are things in your garden are not in a, in a vacuum. And when we're managing uh, pests, we're trying to have long-term solutions. So we're trying to prevent pest problems before they start. So whenever we can change our ecosystem so we don't get pests there in the first place, that is the, the best tool in integrated pest management. So we're looking for long-term prevention. And that doesn't mean lacing your, your garden with uh, pesticides with long residues. It means changing the environment so they're not so hospitable, perhaps, to your pets. Uh, and in terms of, to do to do integrated pest management, you really need to identify the pests properly because we're trying to work with the biology and knowledge of the life cycles of the pests, and so you have to identify them appropriately. Not every bug is a is a bad bug. In fact, most bugs are good bugs, so you need to be able to identify them. Uh, and it also requires regular monitoring of the ecosystem. What does that mean? That mostly means that you're just out there looking, and you're becoming more knowledgeable. The more you look, the, the, the more you see. But on a regular basis, so early in the spring, maybe you're looking for a particular uh, insects that you see every year or certain kinds of weeds that you know start sprouting up at about this time uh, and you're keeping an eye on the health of your plants so that you can maybe manage problems when they're small before they become big problems. And the integrating part of integrated pest management is we're using um, um, a, a number of different kinds of tools uh, complementary uh, tools and we're integrating them together so we're not just relying on pesticides so we're not just relying on plant resistance we're combining maybe some biological control a cultural control uh, maybe a, a pest tolerant species so we're combining these together uh, in an integrated uh, pest management program so let's look at our ecosystem I know this is the picture's not very good, particularly on that screen. But what it is is a landscape with a there's a house uh, there's a there's a house there. We've got a sidewalk. We've got a bunch of different kinds of plant. And so a landscape ecosystem is really very very uh, interesting kind of system to work in. So back to your early uh, biology days. What makes up the ecosystem? Well, first of all, there's the physical environment. And so what's the physical environment? That's all the sort of non-living factors. Uh, what kind of soil type do you have? Or is it a shady area? Uh, oh, what's the general weather or climate? Um, how much water has been there? All these things uh, impact uh, the types of plants that you can grow successfully. And they also impact how successful pests are. So you know that um, certain plants grow better in the shade or in the sun. Maybe there's some plants that grow very well on the coast here, but don't grow very well inland. Uh, and even within neighborhoods, you may have different soil types, which cause you to have more serious problems with nematodes, for instance, than the neighbor maybe a half a mile away who has uh, more organic matter in their soil. So the physical environment really places a limit on uh, your what you can garden. Sometimes you can change some of these things, uh, but other times you can't. You can change the way you water. You may be able to change the shade, but you can't change the weather. And then there's plant variety. So how many different plant species do you have in your garden? A hundred? Hundreds? Does that include the weeds? Yeah. Like a few more? Yeah, you've got a huge number of plants in there. Um, if you, this is much more interesting than growing tomatoes. If you are growing 40 acres of tomatoes, you might just have one variety of tomatoes growing. You try to keep the weeds out of there. It's a monoculture. Um, it's really pretty boring. They have the tomatoes are only going to have maybe 12 or 15 pests that 
are common on them. You can learn that tomato uh, pest management ecosystem pretty fast. We got a book on tomatoes for tomato farmers. Um, and so that's, you know, in some ways um, it's, it's kind of easy. But here you've got a hundred different plant species, at least in your garden. And each of those plants has got its own complex of pests. So it's got its own 12 or pest problems that might occur from time to time. And in most cases, most of these pests are fairly host specific. So most of the pathogens that are going to be on your tomatoes are not going to be on your rose bushes or on your proteas. They, they all have um, uh, different kinds of pests. So it is a very complex ecosystem you're working in. And you know what? No matter how long you study and you're in the Master Gardener program, you're never going to remember all that stuff in your head. And that's why um, you're lucky to have the, the various resources from the University of California that can help you identify uh, the various pests that are on these kinds of plants. And every, so the, the plant variety then determines the herbivores, what's eating those plants is going to depend on what the plant species are, but of course the physical environment also determines what herbivores are going to be successful too. Um, so herbivores would include insects and slugs and snails and mites and bunny rabbits and other uh, birds, uh, other vertebrate pests. We can, for the sake of this conversation here, we'll, well there's plant pathogens and nematodes all that are uh, uh, using plants as their source of food. Uh, and then on top of that, we have carnivores. And the carnivores are eating the herbivores. So in many, ca in many cases, these, we consider them beneficial because they're feeding on our, our pests. And so there you've got a little food chain or food web. Um, sometimes the carnivores are actually feeding on the beneficial insects. So you've got a higher up level on the the food chain. So what you're managing in your garden is, a, is an ecosystem with food webs and food chains. And, and as you work in there, you're going to become familiar and, and, and think about how those, those systems interact. And don't forget human activity. You are part of the ecosystem there too. So you're out there um, driving your truck into a tree, causing damage. You're there <laughs> compacting the soil as you're running across. The, your dog is out there urinating on plants and causing havoc or digging things up. Uh, you, know, you turn on the ir you leave the irrigation on and cause root rot. All these things are you. You are part of this ecosystem. So don't forget the things that you do because. Uh, that has a lot of impact on what happens in there. So in integrated pest management, we're looking to see what factors will impact pests. Uh, thinking about this whole system, and it's really kind of wonderful uh, to think about, I think. Much more interesting than just managing tomatoes. So what are pests anyway? Pests are defined by us. They're organisms that are annoying us or damaging our plants, or eating our house, or something like that, that they're, they're, yeah, definitely bad, but it's all human-oriented. And when we finally wipe ourselves off, the human species, off the face of the earth, there will be no pests. <laughs> there will just be organisms doing what they're supposed to do. You know, eating each other, finding some kind of balance, um, but we really define the pests. And sometimes when you think about it, then you might think, well, it's not really bothering me that much, or it's not really damaging the plant that much, so why should I put a poisonous pesticide down there to, to, to control it? Um, it's very personal, too, because in many, I mean, we can all agree that termites are pests and if you have a house being damaged by it. But there's a lot of other, other situations where people may have disagreements about whether pests are pests. Uh, pests are pests. So it, it's a very personal. And you as master gardeners are going to be dealing with lots of different people with lots of different personal opinions about 
uh, what is a pest or if things are a pest. And in some cases, you can sort of educate them to um, uh, see the positive side of, of some of these organisms, um, and so maybe they won't spray as much. Oh, but in other cases, you, you, you can't, uh, it's a slow process, and you just have to go with the flow. So let's look. So we've got this, who, who thinks tree squirrels are pests? Yeah. Well, a few people here think they're pests, uh, and, and tree squirrels are pests when you're growing uh, some kind of nuts in your backyard. If you have an apricot tree or peach tree, they'll come in there and they'll eat those fruit just the week before you were going to eat them. You know? One bite and all day, they, they'll, they'll take down citrus, oranges, and so if you're growing those kinds of things, they are pests. But there are a lot of people out in the park feeding them peanuts. And so obviously they don't think they're pests. And so it's a matter of what you're growing and your, your situation. Um, scotch broom, familiar with scotch broom? It's a nice, pretty yellow plant. Um, but it's, as was mentioned with uh, one of those uh, plants, the Madeira, uh, uh, plant uh, discuss, discussed before, it's an invasive, and it's really invasive. It's sold at uh, nurseries, um, but uh, it's such an invasive plant that uh, there's an active program to get people, discouraging people from planting it, and programs in some counties to remove it because it's taking over and uh, out-competing some of the native plants. Um, but still, people are in uh, retail nurseries buying it and planting it. So uh, it's, a, it's a matter of opinion and a matter of uh, education. Eucalyptus, do you have much eucalyptus around here? Yes. Not, anymore. <laughs> Not anymore. Is that because of the fire? Uh, part, yeah. no, that's a lot of yeah. And so, um, do you consider it a pest? Yes. Yes. Some people do, some people don't. I mean, it is a can be a fire hazard. Yeah. You don't get freezes here, but in, in Oakland and Berkeley, uh, a decade ago or a couple of decades ago, there was a big freeze, and then that was it, it killed or, or severely uh, injured the eucalyptus all in the hills there. And then the next year there was a fire, and then the eucalyptus with all that. Um, oil or kerosene in them just sort of caused it to, to blow up. So you'll find a lot of people there who really consider it a pest. But um, certainly it's, it's not a native plant. It came from Australia. Uh, it was brought in more than a hundred years ago as a uh, plant first for lumber. It didn't really work very well. But uh, you, there, eucalyptus can be very beautiful um, in, in appropriate environment. Spiders, are spiders pests? No. No, okay. Not even one single person? Oh no, yes. Yes, yes. 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 <laughs> Well, you guys have been well trained as master gardeners because in general, most spiders that we have in our gardens are beneficial because they're, they're feeding on pest insects and so they're reducing pests. There are only, uh, but the, the main spider in California that uh, causes injury to people, uh, serious injury to people, is the black widow spider. And so the black widow spider, uh, if you've got it in your wood pile or in your garage, that would be considered a pest. Uh, and you want to try to limit the habitat so you can reduce the black widow spider. Um, the other spider that there is is the brown recluse. You hear a lot about it, but it's really not uh, established in California. And so most of the stories about uh, uh, the brown recluse are actually some other thing causing the injury to people. But in general, uh, and these spiders are readily identifiable, but most spiders are beneficial. Uh, and you, you're going to get questions like this, people who hate all spiders. and. Don't, and, and say, well, a brown recluse uh, bit me, uh, and I know it's here in San Diego uh, when it is not in San Diego. And you're not, you're not an expert. You are just an extender of information. Uh, but one of the benefits of um, being a bass gardener is that you are connected to the scientists who are experts. One of the, one of the handouts you're getting is 
is the list of the pest notes. And are you guys familiar with pest notes at all? Yes. You are. Somewhat. Have you seen them on the web or you've read some of them? Uh, well, these are these are um, key source memory. These are all written by university scientists. They go through a scientific peer review process. And so, if you want, I mean, so they're they're really uh, uh, good information, and of course, they're completely tailored for the California situation. So, like for instance, if you do have a question about uh, the brown widow spider or the uh, black widow spider or the uh, brown uh, recluse uh, spiders, you can see here under insects, they're here. So there's a specific little publication about these that you can send people to if they have questions, or you can uh, look at them yourself if you're not certain. And so this is, you don't have to go see to the pants, and you shouldn't go see to the pants, uh, because you might make a mistake. Well, and you, you, you know, you're the University of California, you don't want to be giving out information that isn't correct. Oh, and then earwigs. Are earwigs pests? Yes. yes. Anybody think earwigs aren't a pest? Well, earwigs are not a pest in some people's gardens. What do earwigs like to eat? They're not eating. You know, when they're in the artichokes, they're not eating the artichokes. They're eating the aphids in the artichokes. Really? Um, they like to eat young tender plants, so seedlings. They'll eat petals of flowers. Um, you know, they'll get into your corn, um, and so and, and they'll feed on your soft fruit like apricots or strawberries. Yeah, and so if you're growing those things, earwigs are, are definitely can be a pest. But um, earwigs are omnivores. And given a given a choice, they they often prefer to eat an aphid or an insect egg. In fact, they're very good predators of, of aphids, such that uh, apple organic apple growers in Oregon have been known to actually put out little earwig houses to uh, provide a a place for them to reproduce, so that they'll go out there and, and eat the aphids on apples. They're not a pest on apples because Apples don't have the soft uh, tissue that like a peach or a strawberry would. Uh, so it's a case of situation. If you just have a native plant garden, uh, you're not growing uh, vegetables, you have an, maybe an apple tree, an orange tree, uh, they, are, they, are, they could be uh, as much uh, a beneficial as a pest. I mean, I don't, so so it's, a, it's a matter of situation. But earwigs are... Um, they're, they're something that uh, if you if you are trying to grow, if you do have a lot of them, um, they're a little bit tricky to manage. So, like with all kinds of uh, integrated pest management kind of problems, you have to really be thinking about the ecosystem. So, so what's the ecosystem that favors earwigs? Damp, moisture, shade. They need a hiding place. Yeah, they need a hiding place, and then they need those plants that they want to eat, those tender plants. So you, if you're having problems with earwigs, try to change the environment, particularly around your vegetable garden or the flower garden where you're having the problems with the earwigs so that there aren't places for them to hide, that there aren't damp spots for them to, to, to nest in. Uh, and so that is, is part of the management. And then the other big part of managing earwigs is trapping them. So you know that they like to hide in dark places so you can easily trap them with like a rolled up newspaper or, or, or a, a hose tube and every morning come out and knock those earwigs into soapy water or squash them or feed them to your chickens. Um, and keep on a vigilant program of that plus removing the other uh, sources of shelter where they might hide so that they're going to be drawn into your newspaper rolls. And, and, and that's an 
and that's an integrated uh, pest management approach to uh, earwigs. The other one is to tear out your vegetables, just plant native plants, and say. <laughs> so, in addition to the, the pests themselves, the other thing is the level of pests is important in integrated pest management. Um, most of the things that are pests are only pests when they're in high numbers. We can tolerate a few aphids here, we can even tolerate a few hornworms here and there. It's when they get to be high levels and they're really damaging a lot of your plant or your crop that they're intol they become intolerable. And so that's the, the, the critical thing is understanding what level of pests you can tolerate in, in your garden. In some cases, it's what we call, if, if for farmers, for commercial growers, uh, it's an economic threshold for them because they're trying to sell a crop and they can't have pests in their crop. When you're in your growing stuff for yourself or when you have ornamentals you're growing, it's more of an aesthetic kind of thing. It's what you personally, you can, you know, maybe cut that worm out of that, that apple. Uh, and, and you might be perfectly happy. You can chop the end off of your uh, corn, your your ear of corn. Um, so it depends on the aesthetics too. So uh, pests are living things, uh, and living pests, which include insects and rodents and birds and plant pathogens, nematodes, snails and slugs, those are what we call pests, they're living organisms that are damaging our plants. Uh, but our plants are just as often uh, damaged by non-living factors, which we call abiotic, so living is biotic and non-living is abiotic. And so a lot of times the damage that we see in our gardens isn't being caused by living pests is being caused by these abiotic factors. In fact, in many cases, probably more of our damage is due to things like over or under watering, nutrient deficiencies, toxicities, fertilizer damage, herbicide uh, damage, mechanical injury, freezing, sun scald, plants grow in the place where they shouldn't be growing, all these abiotic factors. But but people like to blame some living thing. <laughs> so you go into a nursery with some plant damage, and uh, in most cases, they're going to try to sell you some kind of pesticide, for either a fungicide or an insecticide. People just want to have, they, they don't want to think it's because they didn't fix their sprinkler head or uh, their or that they, they're planting it in a, in a way that, that they shouldn't have done. But whenever you're diagnosing problems, always think of the, these abiotic factors. Could they be causing the problem? Because many times that is what's causing the damage. And damage by many of these abiotic factors can look similar to damage that's caused by pests. So for instance, we have curled leaves here that are caused by aphids and curled leaves here that's caused by 2,4-D, which is an herbicide. It's just one example of the damage spotting on leaves uh, can often be caused by an abiotic factor or also a living factor. So think about the abiotic factors. And I know here these, you know, this is one of the things we can really see how much better these, the pictures are on your other screens, aren't they? Um, but, uh, so for instance, on lawns, <laughs> oh, he, he got these. This is Scott's doing. Yeah, it's really well worth it. You just need a big one right here now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now, I know in a lot of places where I give the presentation, I mean, it's, it's really, uh, the, the, the pictures don't, I mean, this is so much, so much nicer. Um, so uh, anyway, brown spots. People are always complaining about brown spots in their lawns, and they can have many different causes. In most cases, these brown spots are actually caused by abiotic or non-living factors like fertilizer burn or herbicide injury. Often, it's because of <coughs> over or under irrigating. Maybe there's a sprinkler head leak or else one part of the lawn isn't getting sprinkled. It can be dog urine, 
uh, will, uh, especially female dog urine mucosas, these kinds of brown spots. And occasionally it'll be due to like a fungus or a, uh, an insect. But in California, we're very lucky because of our dry summers. Is we really don't have uh, nearly, we don't have fungal diseases on our lawns and lawn grubs are not the kind of common problem that you have in the southeast and the northeast of the United States. They're actually fairly infrequent here, so most of our problems are caused by um, other factors. But if you go into a uh, retail garden center and say, I've got brown spots on the lawn, they're going to either try to sell you a fertil uh, fungicide or an insecticide. But you should not use a fungicide or insecticide um, unless you dig up the uh, the area, an affected area in the areas around and see whether there's actually an insect or a fungus. And with a fungus, you'd need to have that diagnosed by a, um, a, a pathologist, plant pathologist. Uh, you should not be going out there because obviously a pesticide on these kinds of abiotic factors has, does very little good. And personally, I don't think you need to use pesticides on lawns in any case, but that's another so then, the first, it's really important to identify, so in integrated pest management, it's important to identify your pests. And so, do you guys, do any of you guys have a hand lens? Yes, yes. You do? Okay, so you were prepared, but I get to give my little spiel on hand lenses. Because these are so important in the pest past part of your master gardener life. So the hand <laughs> lenses are important because many of these insects, mites, insect eggs, fungal spores, these things are really tiny and, and you need this to identify them. But more importantly, I think, or no, not more importantly, but as important perhaps is having a hand lens like this and you're out there on the master gardener table, uh, help table, and somebody comes in with some poor sick little branch and says, what is this and what do I spray? <laughs> and you're there shaking in your boots. <laughs> I can't answer this question. Well, having this it has, it has twofold importance. One thing is that it gives you credibility. <laughs> Well, this separates you from that person who brought in the plant, is that you are credible because you have a scientific instrument here <laughs> that shows that you're an expert. And so they will trust you. And then the other thing is, is it allows you to take some time to pull it out and look at the problem. It gives you time to think. <laughs> you, you've got to give yourself a little time to think because you don't want to give a nature an answer. Like, I don't know. Uh, because in most cases, you, if you have the tools, uh, uh, you, may be, you probably are going to be able to help them with the problem. So the first thing, in, for instance, in identifying a pest is um, yeah, what you'll remember, uh, what you'll remember when you uh, pull that hand lens out is you remember your master gardener classes and practices uh, where you, you will remember these wonderful books. We have these books, um, this one is hot off the press, Pests of Landscape Trees and Shrubs. Um, and this was the previous version, which this just came out like last month or three weeks ago or something. So I've hardly, uh, I haven't quite even gotten used to it, but this one uh, is still, if you, if you have this one, it's still very good. And, uh, and then you've got Pests of the Garden and Small Farms. And these books, in the back of them, have you, have you guys looked at these books before? Yeah, so you'll have them in your Master Gardener library. You can uh, purchase them yourself, but they have tables in the back uh, of, for this one, for the shrubs. I'm not sure how many are in this new version, but about 200 species of woody trees and shrubs, ornamental ones. And for each one, they list out 8, 12, uh, maybe slightly more pests that are common in California. And so 
you remember how we talked about there could be like a thousand different pests in your backyard, perhaps? Well, you need to narrow it down. <laughs> uh, but you can narrow it down if you know what the plant is. So if you can identify, if you, can, if you know what the plant is, then you can look it up in the table and um, it'll give you symptoms, uh, it'll give you a name, and it'll give you a page to go and look at the symptoms and you can compare it. So this, you will be able to identify uh, 85 or 90 percent of the problems uh, with these books. So this one, Pests of Landscape Trees and Shrubs, is for the ornamentals. Pests of the Garden and Small Farms is for vegetables and fruit trees. It has back tables too. Um, and the only thing that's not covered in those two books are uh, herbace herbaceous flowers. And we don't have, because these books really are geared for the home gardener, so the pest management information, once you get into, you've identified your pests, then there's information on biology, biological control, management for each of the, the pests. Um, for the herbaceous flowers, we don't actually have a, a, a book for home gardeners, but we do have a, a book called Integrated Pest Management for Floriculture and uh, Nurseries, which is for commercial flower growers. Uh, but it has all the flower, most of the flowers that you grow in your backyard and lists of pests. It can help you identify, but you would not uh, specifically use the management uh, recommendations here because they're more for commercial growers. And so these are the back tables in the, um, in the books. Much of that information is also on the UC IPM website, uh, uh, which we'll be talking about later. Uh, the, the diagnostic table information is there, but not quite in the same format. Uh, and then, of course, in your uh, office, you have experts who can help you. Uh, when you can't identify pests, and certainly when you're starting out, you're going to want to have somebody working with you, and because you, you don't want to misidentify pests, so you can work with one of the more senior master gardeners, maybe not more senior, but more experienced master gardeners. Um, but then you also have experts in your office who are scientists. You've got Cheryl Will in here, who is a, a weed specialist, but also knows lots of it, and she also does a lot of stuff with snails and slugs, um, and you have other experts here as, as well as Scott who can help you. Uh, you probably also have your agricultural commissioner's office. The ag commissioner office is your county agriculture department, and they have biologists who also are knowledgeable about pest identification and can sometimes be helpful. What they're particularly interested in are invasive pests, new <coughs> invasive pests that have come into the county. Uh, and so if you have something you think is an invasive pest, they're going to be uh, really interested in. They can send samples up to the California Department of Food and Agriculture, which has pest identification labs um, that can confirm things that are pretty unusual. So this is the UCIPM uh, website. Um, and the, hopefully you will all become pretty familiar with who. Have you looked at it? It's like lots of you have already. Um, and the more you look, the more <laughs> the more you see. I mean, there is a ton of information on this website, and that's one of the problems. People are always saying, "Can't you make it a little easier to access information?" And you know, such and such website. It's so easy to find information. Well, you know why it's so easy to find information on such and such website? They're only covering 25 pests. And if it's only 25 choices, you can make pictures and do all kinds of things. It's, it's quick. But this is covering 1,000 pests on, on um, you know, in the ornamental, in the, in the landscape thing on 250 ornamentals and you know, 50 vegetables and a uh, whole bunch of flowers. So. It's not simple, uh, but the more you use it, the, the more it'll uh, hopefully uh, make sense to you. So this is the general website. You'll see we have main sections. Most of the time you're going to be going to the home, garden, turf, and landscape pest section. Uh, if you're a farmer, you would go to the agricultural pest section. The information here 
is appropriate for people growing co crops in commercial agriculture. You don't want to go into this section for getting management suggestions for home gardeners because a lot of the, the, the recommendations there aren't appropriate for home gardens. There'll be pesticides that aren't registered um, and other more large scale kind of solutions that you don't want to use. Sometimes you can go in there and um, look at, um, uh, you can see there's pictures of pests and it might help you identify things, but don't use the man management information there. There's a little bit on natural environment pests uh, and some stuff on exotic invasive pests. All of that can be improved. But, okay, so if you, if you clicked on that, uh, this box, then you're going to get to this page, uh, which I, I know this is very uh, little, but you have a handout, I think, now of this page. One of the handouts was just handed out is a picture of this page, because I want you to get at least a little bit familiar with this website, and then go home and become more familiar, and then the next time you have a pest problem that you want to find out about, go here and see if you can use this information to help in the board you use it, the more it'll become clear to you. So it is uh, divided into, um, uh, there's, at the top here is pests of home structures and people and pets, so uh, this household pet section is where you've got fleas and house mouse and carpet beetles and um, uh, clothes moths and mosquitoes and yellow jackets, um, the non, the, the pests that aren't termites, uh, that aren't on uh, plants. So it's fairly straightforward. This is where you're going to go. And these are all pest notes here. The next section is pests in gardens and landscapes. And so this is where you're going to go if your pest problems are on plants. And in this section, you can go either by choosing a plant type. Um, if you don't know what the problem is, this is a good way to go in. And it's sort of like looking at these tables because you're going to uh, if you go into flowers, you'll get a list of different flower species, and then you choose the one you've got the problem on, and then it'll give you a list of uh, probable pests there, and so you can search that way. If you know what your pest is, you can go directly into the subcommon pest section, um, and uh, it's categorized by vertebrate pests, arthropod pests, plant diseases, and weeds. You can go directly there to get uh, information. On the quick links up here, this is an important section here. Um, so the pest notes, uh, so these pest notes are all in the pest note library. Um, I'm not sure how many of these there are now. I think about 160 pest notes. Um, and they are fairly sophisticated uh, information uh, written by university scientists and um, you can get those there. There's a lot more information that's in more short form in the other sections of the website, but these will also link you to pest notes. But if you know you want a pest note, you can go directly there and get these. Um, then there's the Quick Tip Library. You all, I noticed, uh, have um, the Quick Tips. My... These are the Quick Tips. I think I saw it. So, did you have them on your table there? Yeah. Is this the first time they have them? Yeah, the quick tips. Yeah, so the quick tips are uh, what these are is uh, they are uh, shorter than the pest notes. Um, but these cards are cards that are available for the master gardeners to take to events um, to give out to people who have uh, questions about pest problems. And, um, they are not, they, they are short for, a lot of people, you know, just want a quick answer. <laughs> they don't want to read a lot. And these quick tips are really good for that. You as master gardeners, when you're researching information, you should go to the pest notes because they're, they're in more in-depth information. They're for more sophisticated gardeners like you. Um, you don't have to read it all, but you should look at it. And so, for instance, and they, they come in a nice PDF format as well as on the web that you can print out with a color printer. But you can see there's a lot of information in a, this is a uh, pest note that I happen to have on the gold spotted oak board, but a lot more information than on one of these cards. 
uh, because you often you want more information to really help you identify uh, and then get real details on how to manage pests. So use the, the uh, pest notes for your own use, but these quick tips are really important. I, it's interesting, a lot of the master, master gardener program, I noticed some master gardeners get confused between the pest notes and the quick tips, but they really are sort of different products. These are abstracted from pest notes, so they're sort of short version. And of course, they don't cover as many pests. I can't remember how many there are. I think there's 40 something of these. But the other thing about the pest notes is they are the only product we have that is in Spanish. So they are uh, also available in Spanish. Yeah. I think you said the pest notes were available in Spanish. Oh, if it's quick tips. See, there are no wonder people are confused. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. The quick tips are available in, in Spanish. The pest notes are not. And um, so if you have, uh, so that's one of the benefits of them as well. But uh, uh, and these gem the. The quick tips generally don't have information on pesticides, what pesticides to use. Uh, more specific information on pesticides they might use would be in the pest notes. So um, there's also a lot of information on pesticides and alternatives uh, and then this special resources section. Over here on this side, there is information that is important to use the weed gallery. That's for weed identification and the natural enemies gallery. Those are places that you'd probably be interested in going at some point. Okay, so I just talked about these quick links here. Uh, so I'm going to go through this. So this takes you to the... The pest notes library, that's what it looks like online. Um, so they're uh, alphabetical um, and according to different groups. Um, so if you have a problem on, but you don't know what it is on an ornamental tree or a bush, you're going to go to the trees and shrubs section here under the uh, pests of the garden, so you're going to go to this one. Say you have a problem on azalea, so you're going to go to the trees and shrubs, that's the ornamental trees and shrubs, and you're going to get a long list of uh, <coughs> trees and shrubs by um, common name and then also by scientific name. You can sort by scientific name if you prefer <coughs> to use that. So here you have azalea here, and you will click on the azalea. <coughs> So there's like more than 200 species here. There are all the, the species that are in the back of that book. Uh, and this would be the page you would get for azalea here. You get a picture that is helpful. It's not horticultural identification, but at least it might confirm to you, yeah, it was an azalea. Um, and then a list of the pests that commonly occur in California on there. So, for instance, you, so you don't have uh, symptoms here like you do in the back of the book, but at least it's a limited list. So say you think, well, yeah, I think maybe it's mealybugs, and then you'll go to uh, a page on mealybugs. This was the short information on mealybugs that we uh, have had on the web for a number of years, but it's not the pest note. Now it'll probably link to the pest note, but these short informations provide um, good information on uh, identification, pictures, um, damage, and uh, management. Um, uh, here's another example, powdery mildew, um, again on azalea, and you click on that and it go to the pest note. So this is what the pest note looks like on the web. Um, it's not as attractive as, if you are printing it out, I recommend that you use the PDF. See up here it says PDF to print. It also links to a quick tip. So the quick tip is the this version. It's sort of an abstract on powdery melt, mildew. And then there's also a nota brava that links to the Spanish version of the quick tip on powdery mildew. Uh, so the pest notes have lots more information. Each of these blue things uh, links to more photographs. Um, at the very bottom, if you scroll down to the very bottom of most of the pest notes now, 
you'll get uh, at the very bottom, it'll have active ingredients compare risks. Um, and that is the risks of the pesticides that are suggested. So people, <coughs> many people are very interested on the impact of the very pesticides I might use on the garden, on um, uh, natural enemies, on water quality, on human health. Um, the, this will link you to that information. And uh, now what am I doing? Uh, but if you know what the pest is, again, you can go to the subcommon pest thing, for instance, and you know it's an insect, maybe it's a caterpillar, then you're going to click on this insect section here, and you will come to, uh, for this insect section here, we have it categorized by general categories of insects. It's been one of the things is people say, can't you help us key out these insects? <coughs> the problem is we have so many that it's, it is tricky and that's why we focused on trying to get people through the plant. But these are general categories. Most people will um, identify groups like ants, bees, wasps, caterpillars, household pests, aphids. If you click on any of these boxes, um, for instance, this is caterpillars, and then once you get to the caterpillar section, we will have caterpillars in um, different uh, categories of areas, ones that, that go into fruit, ones that are indoors, ones that are on lawns. Frankly, if you know your caterpillar is on tomatoes, it's better to go through in the tomato than go through here. But if you're just curious about caterpillars, this is a, another way to go. And then once you click on one of these, um, you'll get a list of caterpillars, leafy caterpillars on flowers and vegetables and then you can link directly to information. Uh, if you know what the pest is, you can link to this table of all invertebrate pests. And this is very, this is a very long list by common name, scientific name, by family <coughs> order. And you can go through this and uh, this is, I don't know how many are here, but probably almost a thousand uh, insects there if you want to go directly to information. So it's way more than there are in the pest stems because there's short information or some. I know you, you're going to cut me off. Just let me just finish this little section on the web and then, then you can have an extra minute off my own pipe. The seasonal landscape checklist is a new thing. Um, that I won't spend any time on. Um, San Diego, oh, well, San Diego didn't, but they're developing those. On. And then there's lots of other useful information on the Natural Enemies Gallery, the Weed Gallery, so these can help you identify weeds, natural enemies. Um, uh, there, uh, we have our uh, YouTube video uh, stage. A lot of this is really good stuff for uh, using in education. They're all under three minutes, they're short information. Uh, on how to manage some how of the most you, common things. Yeah, how, how did you get the YouTube link? Yeah, okay, the YouTube link uh, from, came from uh, <coughs> the, uh, if you go to oh, under the quick link, quick, yeah. under the quick link. No, I see. Yeah, no, I should have quick links. Uh, quick links. Uh, talk about the quick tips. You guys know about the, the kiosk, which is back there. Um, Actually, Mary Lou, they don't know about the kiosk. This will be the first time they've really seen Okay. It. Well, so you will notice uh, in the back of the room, and so during your break, you can fiddle around with this kiosk. The UC, it's the UCIPM kiosk, and it's got information on um, pests in both English and Spanish, and the master gardeners will take it to various events, and it, you don't have to have an internet connection. Uh, it, it, it does print out some of the quick tips, or I think most of the quick tips, plus other information. Uh, so it'll be a tool that you'll use. Um, and you find, you know, if you're in a place where there's kids, they'll, they'll come and they'll be really interested in it. So, um, let me go. Um, we have information on turf pests at the UC Guide to Healthy Lawns. That's what you get to when you go to the, the lawn information. And the thing about lawns, and I don't have time to talk about it, but just, you'll notice it's the UC Guide to Healthy Lawns. It's not the UC Guide to Pests in Lawns. Because lawns should, we should manage, if you manage your, your turf so that it is healthy and robust, you have the right species, it's growing competitively, you really shouldn't have 
much in the way of pests. Yeah, you'll have a few weeds in it, but they're green, you can mow them as long as they're not predominant. So the, the, the concept here is the reason that we grow lawns um, is because they are easy. We don't grow lawns because we want to use a lot of fertilizer and a lot of water and a lot of uh, pesticide, which a lot of people do. And this really gets that philosophy over there. There is a vantage pest thing, but all these cultural practices uh, are important for keeping your lawn vigorous so you, you, you don't have to have pests. Lawn re if, if you do have problems, then you've got to go to the lawn renovation and you know, redo the lawn or plant something else. Lawns aren't appropriate in lots of environments. Too. And finally, um, finally, the last thing I wanted to point out to you is this Master Gardener page. Um, and so if you go at the bottom of the, um, I'm going to get yours again. Under the uh, special, yeah, special resources for under the picture there, the first one is, well, the third one is the UC Master Gardeners. If you click on that, you'll get to this special page that was created for Master Gardeners. Most of the information is similar, is the same information that's on the web. Like all the pest notes are, uh, uh, pest notes and quick tips are here, um, and the videos. But it was formatted in a way, because this is the information the Master Gardeners uh, most often may need. And the other key thing about this uh, section is that there's, uh, that isn't on, um, the rest of the page is special training programs for master gardeners. So there's, uh, we have training programs on biological control, um, on pesticides, on different kinds of issues. Uh, and you can use these, there's PowerPoints, there's handouts, there's in some cases posters. Um, and so this is uh, your entryway to those. To get to the PowerPoints, you actually have to go through the ANR um, uh, system and, and Scott can help you with that if you want to do that. But we're trying to uh, encourage uh, master gardeners to use these presentation tools in their educating their own communities. And so mm -hmm. uh, take a look at that. Do you got do you ever use that master gardener page? It's also where you get to the kiosk for um, <coughs> reserving it. Do the master gardeners or do the master gardeners here mostly just go use the regular page? Yeah, I think the regular, I think it's a combination of there's some folks that, are, that go directly through the, the main site and then there are master gardeners. I think they're trained um, in the number of things you can develop and that they're going through that, so it's a combination.